Karen. Our next speaker, uh, many people know, Wendy McKay is also going to talk about a journey, but earlier in the journey. So please welcome Wendy McKay. Thank you. Turns out there are a number of origin stories here, and I have another one. So I'm going to take you through a decade with tremendous technical change, but also a major change in my way of thinking about the world. So in 1974, I took a computer course, and I hated it. It was a stack of cards, 24-hour turnaround. You misplace one semicolon. It's do it all over again. Boring, boring, boring. I knew in 1974 I was never going to touch a computer again, for sure. I went on into psychology, which I loved. And in fact, I went into graduate school. And the topic was teaching monkeys to talk, which is a different story I won't tell you here. Anyway. We ran psychology experiments. We would present lights and buttons and things for the monkeys to press. All of this was done with solid state circuitry, 50 bucks for an AND gate, thousands of dollars to run one experiment. And my job was not to program those, because I didn't know how to program, really, but to read paper tapes that had holes punched in them. So my job as a graduate assistant was to work with a little piece of cardboard and slide these things through and count the dots and add up all the dots and do the stats. Boring. So it turned out that DEC, who we just heard about, had made a real-time operating system computer, the PDP-11. And there happened to be one in the lab that nobody knew how to use, but it had a paper tape reader. Yes. So what I did was I taught myself how to use the computer. And now it actually started getting a bit interesting, because now I could actually play with my data. And I could do all kinds of other things. It took me a year and a half, and I started to really do things. But then my advisor disappeared. Another long story I won't bore you with. But I ended up at DEC. Great place in those days. That was the Google of uh, the 1970s. And I entered into educational services because I was the one woman anywhere you could see who could actually know something about learning and programming. And shortly after I arrived, they announced a brand new technology, a computer called VAX 780. Wow. We got the fourth one off the production line. And it went into educational services. And our job was to help do the training for that computer. Now, the way the training worked in those days is that you would go to Bedford, Massachusetts, and spend two weeks learning how to use this mini computer. And again, all the training is focused on how to get these high-tech people bowing to the machine. This is what it does. This is what it does. Unfortunately, the market for that machine were managers and secretaries and marketing people. And you know what? They didn't want to spend two weeks in Bedford, Massachusetts. So I went to my boss, very enthusiastic 23-year-old. Yes, I think we can do interactive training. I can put, you know, teach people how to do this stuff. And he said, that's a really stupid idea. Do not waste your time building such a thing. So me being me, I did my job, I did my day job, and then I spent nights and weekends building the course that I wanted to have when I was a grad student and I wanted to learn how to do this stuff. And so that worked, um, but nobody knew about it. So DEC every six months had something called DECUS, which is a week-long course not a course, a conference, a conference. And all the customers came in, and this new prototype, VAX, was there. And I uploaded my course, and customers would come by. And my job, actually, was just, just to man the booth, to have somebody be there. Um, but I pointed them at my course, and they took it, and they said, oh, this is fantastic. This is great. How can we buy it? And I said, well, um, you can't. But there's a suggestion box in the corner, so just put in a note. and." fine. And the other thing is, being a good psychologist, I took notes, and I watched, and I observed how they used it. I never told them that I had written it. And basically, that was fine. I went home. Three weeks later, 
my boss comes literally running into my little cubicle, and it was a very little cubicle, and he said that a senior vice president, four levels above him, wanted to see me. Uh-oh. So I go into his office, shaking. Again, I'm 23. I'm the only woman there. And he says, customers are demanding an interactive system for teaching them how to use this computer. I've looked all over the company. Nobody knows about it, but somebody said, you might know something. So I said, OK. Um, if you give me $200,000, I will build such a system and ship it at first customer ship. Remind, remember, this is a prototype at the moment. And he said yes. Now, to give you an idea, my salary was $18,500 a year. So $200,000 was a lot of money. So I didn't just rewrite this course. I thought about it, and I could hire people now. Well, actually, I couldn't. My boss could, but you know, effectively. But there were no programmers. There were no HCI people. There were no people like you out there. They didn't exist. So we hired some teachers. We hired some artists and designers. And now what I thought was, OK, I'm going to redo this, but I'm going to redo it in a different way. I'm going to create a system that we ended up calling Draw, which allowed you to put graphics and text on the screen. And we had a separate program that we called Design, very clever names. And that was the logic that puts things all together. And with that, I was able to redo my course and do a separate course on the EDT editor. And it was bundled at first customer ship with the VAX VMS computer. So that was great. That gave me a little bit of street cred, very little. And I ended up doing a bunch of different courses. And we, we did over 30 products. Now, I'm going to jump forward a couple of years. Now we're in 1983. I went to the first Kai. I was blown away by the fact that there were all these people who thought like me. This was great. But there were a couple of other technological changes that happened at the same time. One, MTV had arrived. And there was a cool new technology called the video disc. Ben mentioned it. Half an hour, high quality video, 54,000 frames. Great. And that was going to be sold to the world um, for doing music videos. Second innovation, screens got a whole lot better. The GG terminal had eight, count them, eight colors. Then we went to 256. Then we went to thousands. And we could do a lot more than 24 by 80 character animation. And the third thing was a woman engineer who has forgotten to history, but her name was Lynn Olson. And she figured out how to take any video feed and put it onto a terminal. And DEC took my draw. We basically put my animated graphics on top of the video. And now we had a system where we could actually create interactive graphics. 1983, before the Macintosh, before HyperCard, before all of that, a real product. Now, the product was called IVIS. It was the Interactive Video Disc Instruction System. And the first video disc we did, also shipped at first customer ship, was the interactive troubleshooting simulator. And again, going back, I interviewed a bunch of field service technicians. And I discovered that they did not want to have a step-by-step, -step, here is how the system worked. But rather, they wanted to troubleshoot it. So what we did is we went to the beta testers, and we found all the top, it was over 30 key problems that happened. And we turned those into little stories. And then we had a claymation character and shots of the prototype hardware. And he spoke deck talk. It was the first commercial application of deck talk, uh, which if you're on the San Francisco BART subway and you listen to the guys, th that's deck talk. Anyway, and so that was a major success. And so we went out. And it was great. And I ran a research group. And we built all kinds of cool stuff. We worked with Andy Lipman at the Media Lab. And they did the Aspen disk. Well, we went up to Penobscot Bay. And we mapped Penobscot Bay. And we did Video Boxer, if any of you know Boxer. And we did a whole bunch of really cool things, none of which we published because it was all corporate company confidential. So it's lost to history now. But 
you would think that this would be considered a success inside the company. The company was using it for all its internal training now. It radically changed the way they sold and thought about their companies. But it didn't stop a senior vice president from hauling me into his office yet again. And this time he yelled at me for 20 minutes and he said, Wendy, who on earth wants to watch TV on a computer? Such a stupid idea. So I thought, well, you know, maybe I better go back to school, finish my PhD, went off to MIT, did a bunch of different stuff. We did video there, we did a bunch of things. And I just wanted to say, 20 years later, I got an email from one of the members of my group who happened to have been a high school student at the time, just passionate about video and our vision of how we can make the world learn and find out about everything through video on a computer. And he said, Wendy, I've done five startups, and the last one made me rich. And the last one was YouTube. So, just want to end with, I now have sons who are approximately the same age as me. Both of them have learned an incredible number of things through YouTube. And now, they also create their own videos online. So our vision from the early 80s is now finally something that we can take advantage of. So thank you very much.